Hello and welcome to my talk about the Bearbox Bootloader and some of its nifty features that I would like to share with you. My name is Ahmad Fatoum. I am an embedded Linux developer with Pingotronics, a German Linux consulting company where I have been using Bearbox for the last two years. As for the structure of my talk, I will start with an obligatory what's a bootloader. Then we will talk a bit about the complexities that arise, how Bearbox came to be. Then we will look at how to port Bearbox to a new board, how to customize Bearbox for a simple booting uh, mode, then how to do it for redundant boot. Then we will look at using Bearbox for bring up. And along the way, we will discuss these abstractions that have evolved in Bearbox to keep the complexity of it all at bay. So to start off, what's a bootloader? So on a modern SOC, you have some sort of boot ROM that's masked into the ship. This does the bare minimum needed low-level initialization to, lure, to load our bootloader into an on-ship SRAM. And from there on, our bootloader has to do all the other initialization that the boot ROM didn't know how to do. It needs to set up the SDRAM controller, it needs to configure the clocks and the PLLs, and then it needs to access the boot medium to fetch the kernel and any other binaries that it might need, for example, an initRD or a device tree. And at the end, it will start the kernel with these parameters and images. But we have come to expect more of the bootloader. So there might be other firmware besides the main processor that need firmware loaded for. So there might be a secure monitor binary that we need to load. The boot process should also be fast. So we need to use the caches, which on some architecture means that we need to have a driver for the memory management unit. And fetching the kernel from the boot medium isn't always the same. We might have different boot media and we need to try them in order. We might have multiple partitions on the same boot medium. So we need to have some decision making to decide which partition to use. We might need to enable a boot splash because the boot process takes a bit longer than anticipated. Uh, we might need to kick off a crow processor or even communicate with it out of the bootloader because it has access to some peripherals that we don't, for example, some clocks or reset lines. And when we have the kernel image, we might not be able to boot it directly. We may need to check a cryptographic signature to be sure that it's, uh, it's a kernel image that needs to be booted. There might be device tree fix ups that we need to do on the device tree binary. For example, we can have the same board once with a display and once without. And the bootloader needs to detect which kind of board it is. And then it will fix up the device tree to either have a display or not. Then we might need to enable a watchdog so we can monitor the boot process. And then at the end, we can do which is a, uh, what the bootloader is ultimately made for to start the kernel. But this gets complex real fast. But we want to maintain a scalable and maintainable code base, so we would uh, prefer to have some abstraction to keep uh, the complexity uh, lower. Uh, arguably useful abstractions are a driver model, so uh, an SD card controller, a host controller, they uh, do basically all the same thing. They interact with some hardware and then they allow you to set IO settings and they allow you to send MMC commands over the MMC protocol. So it would be nice that all MMC uh, host drivers implement the same interface and then you can handle them all the same from the same uh, MMC core. And you could have, for example, this MMC core provide you a block device operations. So at the end, someone using this will just interact with read write of uh, blocks and doesn't have to worry about the specifics that it is an SD card, for example. Uh, typed, uh, tightly uh, connected to that is having some separate hardware description. So um, a device-specific language like device tree is uniquely positioned to uh, represent these complex hardware setups that we have nowadays, where you have SOC families that share some IP cores and share and don't share some others, where you have system on modules that can be fit on different baseboards. So you would appreciate having some sort of code reuse or inheritance, which can be done nicely with device tree. Uh, 
there are some other abstractions like a virtual file system. So you would uh, appreciate having the ability to just mount a file system at a location and then you can interact with it like any other file system and you don't have to keep track for, okay, I have this partition on the MMC and that has an X4 on it. So I need to use the read and write operations that are meant for X4. You can just use a generic read and write. Uh, having a block layer, so you can do caching of blocks, having character devices, so you can abstract away the differences between, let's say, a registry map that's just memory mapped I.O. or a registry map that's connected over SPI. Uh, and you will want to interact with these character devices and with the drivers interactively. So you need to have a shell prompt and you need to be able to write scripts for your shell. And you would like uh, to have the ability to persist these scripts that you have uh, written. Uh, and all this is for ha having the ability to introspect your system. So you can do rap rapid debugging and rapid uh, debugging cycles. You might be inclined to think that this is basically what uh, Linux is already capable of doing, which is right. You could compile a Linux with a built-in inner tram FS, with a built-in device tree, and that would check all these above boxes. But the boot process is very much size constrained because you need at first to fit into an SRAM and then uh, you chain load your second stage, which also should be small so you don't spend too much time in it. And Linux would still need to be extended to support stuff like SDRAM initialization and so on and clock setup uh, and this low-level clock setup and here comes the idea that why shouldn't we take an existing bootloader and extend it with this useful part of Linux for bootstrapping uh, um, that's basically how Bearbox came to be so it started as a U-boot fork called U-boot version 2 in 2007 it was renamed to Bearbox in 2009 it's licensed under the GPL2 and it has a monthly release cycle. And now it supports a couple of architectures, ARM, MIPS, x86, EFI, uh, RISC-V. And its main selling points back then were a Linux-like driver API. So uh, you have a driver model inspired by Linux and you have drivers that implement the same API or, the, or an API that's very similar to the one used within Linux. So this makes porting easier. The coding style is that of uh, which Linux adheres to. It doesn't use header files for configuration. Instead, it uses a kernel uh, config system and it uses cabled for building the kernel. And for the user API, it has a POSIX-like file descriptor-based API, so you can just open a file in the virtual file system, read and write uh, to it and from it. And it can also be accessed over a Unix-like interactive shell where you have your usual utilities. So that's basically uh, what Bearbox was uh, made for. And over the years, there have been some more features that are more uh, about uh, booting, which we will uh, look like during this talk. So uh, let's see how we can port Bearbox to your board. So you can split a traditional booting process into a first and a second stage. The first stage does this low-level initialization uh, that's needed to load the second stage that would be on your personal computer as a BIOS. And the second stage is what runs from the SDRAM, which can a bit bigger than the limited SRAM or flash you have. And this one loads the kernel that's then, uh, so which is our operating system, which we should load. And Bearbox can be used as boss. So on some SOCs, it can be used as second stage. On some others, it uh, can be used as first stage as well. We will look in this talk how to use Bearbox as a second stage for your board. So uh, if you have worked with a Linux multi-platform kernel, you might think the same as me. That's a pretty great thing that you can have just this one generic image and use it on dozens of different SOCs on hundreds of different boards. This all works because you have a separate device tree description and this device tree describes the actual hardware you have on your board. And then you start the kernel which is a multi-platform ARM kernel, for example. And it then when it has done the low-level initialization, it uses a device tree to discover what kind of devices are there. So you can have multiple devices, uh, drivers, but only the drivers for the devices that are actually there are activated. 
And for the second stage bootloader, we would like to have some similar setup. Uh, we can't uh, depend on another bootloader to pass us a device tree, usually, as the kernel does. So what we do is that we define a new pre-bootloader, and this pre-bootloader passes us a device tree. And the uh, pre-bootloader we will call PBL in this talk, uh, and the uh, normal bare box binary we will call bare box proper. So how that looks like, we see to the right, we have uh, three examples. Once we have bare box prefixed with a pre-bootloader, and a device tree, and the pre-bootloader passes a device tree to Bearbox. Another time we have two device trees, and Bearbox can decide which device tree to use in the PBL and pass that. And in the middle, we see another example where we have just one device tree, but some firmware, which we need to early load. So that's something we can also use a PBL for. One short slide about the first stage bootloader. How would that look like with the image format that we have just shown? So the best way would be to do the clock setup and the SDRAM in the PBL. We see that on the IMX, so the PBL runs. It will see that it's not running from SDRAM, so it loads, uh, so it does a low level setup and then it chain loads bare box again with the same PBL, but this time it loads a full image not the uh, small image, that's only the FSBL part, into our uh, SDRAM, and then Bearbox is run again, and it will see, okay, now I am running from the SDRAM, so now let's do the normal boot up, where I extract Bearbox to the end of the SDRAM and branch to it. Uh, this is very nice for development because you have good compile time coverage. You can just build, for example, the IMX version 7 dev config and it builds images for over a hundred bots at once. And it's nice for integration too. So you will probably not use a dev config for your bot, but you might have a few different IMX bots. So you can use the same config for all of them, the same uh, be a recipe in your BSP, and that will generate you uh, more than one image, one image for each of your bots. And an alternative that might be easier is to build Bearbox twice and then override the uh, first stage bootloader in it so that it just chain loads the SSBL. You can do that, but this comes at the cost that the FSBL is no longer multi-image capable. So multi-image is that what you see to the right, that you have just Bearbox separately, and each time for each bot, it's prefixed with a bot-specific pre-bootloader. Now that we have talked about this, let's look how you can make this work on your bot. So we will assume you are using device tree, and further, it would be nice if you are a good citizen and have already upstreamed your device tree into the kernel. If that's the case, you just need to wait a bit, and Bearbox will import all Linux device trees into slash DTS. This is done on a regular manner. And as soon as that happened, you can define a bare box DTS. We see that here. What the bare box DTS is doing is it's including the upstream device tree. Then it's including a SOC device tree that's uh, specific to bare box. Then it's, that's all you need. You can also add some uh, extra nodes. Here we add a node for having a persistent environment on the EMMC in a partition called Bearbox Environment. And at the time of writing, the upstream device tree didn't have a reset GPIOs property. So this is fixed up in the Bearbox device tree. Now we need to pass this device tree to Bearbox proper. So you need to have a pre-bootloader entry point. We see here how that looks like. You do some low-level initialization. This may set up the stack or uh, the caches if needed. Then we print some symbol to make debugging easier in future. So you can uh, see if uh, the pre-bootloader entry has been entered, which is the very first code in Bearbox. So this is always a nice debugging aid. If something doesn't work, turn on low-level debugging and see if anything is printed. And then we pass the device tree and the memory base and size address to the bare box entry point. And uh, we don't see an explicit base and uh, size here because we have a macro that passes the correct base address for the SOC family and that asks our SDRAM controller about the size. So we need not uh, specify this here. So we have no duplication. After that, we need to uh, add a bot driver 
uh, or we don't need to, it's uh, optional. So as soon as you have called the bearbox entry function, this will link in bearbox proper, but you, this bearbox proper is not bot specific in any way, but you might want to have a bot driver that matches against your bots compatible to do stuff like handling hardware quirks or registering device tree fix ups, or even modify the live unflattened device tree that's within bearbox. Uh, we see an example here. So we have a system on module and we match against the compatible of it. And then we change the model name. The model name usually comes from device tree. It's a bit too long for the slides, so it's made shorter here. And then we register a Bearbox update handler. That way Bearbox knows how to update itself. And that looks just like any other uh, bot driver. You can have multiple and they are chosen uh, according with the device to the acquired device tree that's passed to Bearbox. Then you need to tell kconfig and kbuild about the device tree, the preboot loader, and maybe our bot driver if we had at one. Uh, how that looks like, we see here lowlevel.c was the name of the low level code, that's the preboot loader. Uh, it's compiled to a low level.o, so we add that to the uh, low level y variables. Same goes for the bot driver, we add that to opt which are the objects for the normal pair box. Then we have a kconfig menu entry, so you can select it uh, in the menu config. Uh, and then we tell Bearbox to descend in the directory and to build the device tree. By default, everything is linked into Bearbox and at link time, uh, stuff is discarded that's not needed. So there is no problem in having multiple device trees built. We can just uh, pick and choose what we actually want to use. And now that we have done this, we have a need for an image to contain all of this. And that's how it looks like. It looks a little, a, a bit like boilerplate. And indeed it is. You are best served by checking what other bots are doing for your SOCs and just copying that. But uh, to explain uh, succinctly what we are doing here, we are adding a new entry point to the list of PBRs. Then we give the new image a name and we give it a format to use. The format here is a .stm32. There is a rule above that calls an uh, external tool that will format our bearbox binary by prefixing it with a header. And that's what the FSBL uh, is expecting of us. And now that you have done all of this, you can restart the bearbox build process by typing make with the appropriate variable set. Bearbox will prompt you for the new board, which you can accept. Then it will build a new Bearbox proper because you have changed Bearbox itself by adding a board driver. And then it will take that Bearbox proper and link it once with every enabled board. And that resulting image you can uh, put on your boot medium and have the FSBL uh, run it. And when you do that, you should see something like that. So you have uh, here a Bearbox uh, boot log, you will see that it by default fails because it will try to network boot if nothing is else is uh, configured. Uh, it will try here to boot a username, which is none, dash Linux, dash host name of the device, which comes from the device tree. And understandably, this is not available over TFTP yet. So it will just fail and tell us that nothing bootable has been found. Which brings us to the next part. How can I customize Bearbox? So, for example, the username is not none, but my initials. This is done in Bearbox via the environment. We have already seen kconfig, which can be used for configuration. But the problem with kconfig is that it's global in scope and you can't do bot specific configuration in it because that would break multi-image. So if you have your hundred bots, they surely don't all boot from the same MMC, for example. So you can just put this into the kconfig. And the solution in Bearbox for that is a built-in environment. You have a default environment. We see that to the right. So the default environment is a directory structure. Uh, indeed, every environment is that can contain boot scripts or uh, binaries that can be loaded, some data, some init scripts that are automatically loaded and some default uh, non-volatile variables, which we see at the very end. Then there is a feature specific environment that's overlaid on top. For example, if you have device firmware upgrade enabled, it can add you some scripts that are specific to that USB feature, 
You can have bot-specific environment. So each bot can, in a, the make file for in the bot directory, can say bbenv and add a new directory that's overlay that can then be overlaid on top. And you can have an external environment, which you will usually use if you have a BSP and you are using the same environment for different bots. So Bearbox can be just told in the kconfig, use this directory for an environment that's overlaid at the very end. And this environment is built in. It's built into Bearbox. And at runtime, Bearbox will mount it under slash env. And from there on, bot code and init, init scripts can read write it, but that's just at runtime. Persistence is done um, separately. How that look like? We can see here. We have these two variables, auto boot and user. And we set auto boot to a bot, so it doesn't continue booting because we are debugging. And we set user to my initials. Bearbox will tell you NV variables are were modified and that they will on shutdown be saved automatically. How that looks like, we can do a recursive listing of the slash env directory and we so will see at the very end that we now have an auto boot and a user file and these will have our new values. So uh, a variable like user that's called a magic variable. They are so called because they are evaluated at different places in the Bearbox execution flow. You can list them with a magic var command. We see that uh, below. So for example, there's opt arg. If you do option parsing on in the shell, which it will have the option argument. There is boot source, which tells you uh, where Bearbox came from, from example, from an MMC or from a USB. And there are also some nifty stuff like boot and provide machine ID, which will have Bearbox fix up the global machine ID, which for example comes from your SOC serial uh, into the kernel command line. So systemd can use it. Most of these magic variables we see here are global variables. And these global variables will be initialized at startup from the corresponding non-volatile uh, NV variables. So if I set global user, it will be just active for runtime. If I set NV user, this will be saved to the non-volatile non environment uh, directory. And on the next startup, Bearbox will load the environment and check, OK, I have an NV user. So it will initialize global user with that value. These global variables or global parameters are so called because they are associated with an abstract um, global device. You have many more devices in Bearbox and every device driver can associate these device parameters with the devices. Uh, yeah, and that's the way you do runtime configuration in Bearbox. So how that looks like, we can see to the left uh, below, we have a device that's called temp reboot mode. This device uh, driver, the driver for this device is Syscon reboot mode, which was basically just ported over from Linux. It does parsing of a device tree nodes that we see here. Uh, this device tree node has uh, some modes, for example, normal, loader, fast boot, and each has a value. And if you set this reboot mode, it writes that value at the identified offset in a register. And that way, the operating system can return some value to the bootloader, so it customizes the uh, next boot. Uh, the driver is, as I said, just uh, ported from uh, Linux, and it adds some Bearbox specific stuff like this dev at param enums that we see to the right. This registers a parameter of type enumeration with the name next that should call a callback whenever it's set, and it has these possible values. We see that in the dev info input. So next has current value of normal. It has the type enumeration and it has these possible values. And then as soon as we have registered this parameter, we can interact with it from the shell. So we can echo it, which we are doing here. And we see, okay, the previous value was normal. We can set it, which will call our callback. And then we can do a reset. And on the next reset, Bearbox should see, okay, I am now uh, having the reboot mode of fast boot. Uh, let's see how we can tie that all together. Uh, you can so far have seen that we can do that on the shell. We can on the shell uh, set variables, uh, read the value out of them, but often you will want to write scripts. You can do that with hash, which is the default shell in Bearbox. You can add hash scripts to slash env slash bin, 
and from there on they are in the path so you can just tap complete to get them and they can interact with the variables that we have seen so there are also some core shell utilities like cat echo memory display memory write so you can um, modify the variables and also the character devices that we see to the right so you have different character devices for example for eproms or hardware run hardware random number generators uh, that you can interact with and you can have init scripts that are run automatically for example slash env slash init everything run in that directory will be automatic uh, everything located in that directory will be run automatically we have seen that reboot mode before how that works is that it will source slash and slash b mode global reboot mode pref which is what is written in that register on startup so that way we can define a fast boot boot mode if we would like and at the end, we can also uh, have boot scripts, which customize how Bearbox should boot. We see here an example boot script. It's called MMC. It's opened in Bearbox code editor. And uh, we see what it's doing. It's that it's uh, checking if NV boot default is set. If so, there has been an override. So just exit. And then it checks if the boot source is from MMC. Then it sets global boot default to be MMC with boot source instance dot root concatenated. So what this is basically doing is that it says if I am coming from an SD card, boot try to boot the root partition on that SD card, the partition that's called boot. And if I come from another SD card or from an MMC, use that one's root partition instead. So these are just a few lines of code, which you can do a bit more complex setup easily with. So let's uh, see how we can use that all for boot. So Bearbox has the boot command, which is the default entry point for booting. And as you see, it has a lot, uh, big help text because it's a very versatile tool. So instead of using a boot script like we have just seen before, let's take a step back and ask ourselves what is it what we want from the booting process? How should it look like? And then we can see how we can use uh, boot best. So um, if you have a rootfs partition and that rootfs partition has a slash boot directory and that slash boot directory also uh, already has a kernel, a device tree, an init rd, device tree overlays, boot arguments. It has all this stuff in a single place you shouldn't need any bootloader configuration now because it's all there. At most, what you need is a file that describes which kernel to choose, which device tree, which boot arguments, and that file you can place on the boot partition itself. And then the bootloader doesn't need any extra info. It should detect everything else as soon as it knows which partition it is. So a memory layout, you don't need to tell the bootloader where should the kernel be located or where should the device tree be located. You just need these image buffers to be correctly aligned, to be non-overlapping, and the bootloader can already dynamically determine that, so no need to hard code it. You shouldn't need to tell the bootloader what kind of file system it is. It can just check some magic signature and just mount it on the fly on first access. So you don't need to do this manual step in front. Same goes for the image format. So you could also check the uh, magic signature of the image and call the appropriate handler. And you don't want to repeat yourself. Your bootloader already has bought specific uh, information. For example, it needs to know which root partition to use. So it could generate a root, uh, root uh, equals argument for the kernel, and it knows which console to use for output. So it can pass along that exact same console to the kernel. So you don't want to write this again. And you still need the ability to exactly specify these, if needed. As for the first point, uh, Bearbox uses the bootloader specification, which you can read the full text of on systemd.io. We see here an example at a well-known location, slash loader slash entries. We have a couple of files. And these boot spec files, they have a title for using a menu. They have uh, options that are to be passed to the kernel. They identify a Linux binary, a device tree binary. And that's all the information you need. So you can just tell Bearbox to boot this partition. Bearbox will mount it. It will look at that directory. And then it will iterate over the files there. We have one file 
that references a device tree with a compatible that doesn't match the compatible that the Bearbox device tree has. So this is ignored. Then it finds the correct device tree. It will say that it will attempt to boot it. It will fix up a root uh, option for the kernel to use. It will load this into memory and it shows you the command line. And at the end, it will abort because here we have minus D for a dry run. And we see here that this root argument was never never explicitly stated in the example that we have shown. This is because Linux append root, which is written in the boot spec, is a Bearbox extension for appending the correct root automatically. This allows us to have a boot spec that's storage agnostic. So you could just extract what's in this partition to a network share, makes this available over network file system, point Bearbox at it, and you can boot it all the same. Bearbox would fix up the correct root equals NFS and IP addresses and so on. And that means that you just need one configuration in Bearbox for such a simple booting scenario, which is where to get the uh, this partition from. And we see that at the very bottom, we have mmc.0.4, which is our fifth partition. We start counting from zero and we just need to put this into boot default and then we are good to go. Bearbox will do everything we have seen here because it starts boot by default after the countdown and then it will just mount, check the boot specs and then in the end boot the kernel with the specified parameters. Uh, this is a very simplified boot. We want in this talk to go a bit beyond just booting. So let's look about a more complex booting scenarios, having two rootfs partitions. Why would we like to have two rootfs partitions? So we can run one uh, boot partition and then on um, and then uh, update the other partition while we are running. Then we can reset. And before that, tell the bootloader to try the other partition next time. Then we can boot into the next system. And if that boot process fails for whatever reason, we need to have a fallback. So AB partitions are uniquely, uh, uh, are very suitable for that. And how that looks like in Bearbox, it's, uh, we see to the left with boot chooser. So boot chooser can define different boot targets. These two boot targets can have attempts, how many times they are retried, and there is automatic fallback between, between them. For all of this to work, we will need to detect this update failure. So it can uh, revert back to the other partition. And the user space needs an ability after an update to say, well, let's try the Neo partition. And for that, we need mutable variable storage. We have the environment, which could be used for that, which we are already using for that during development for saving, say, uh, NV variables. But it's inadequate for use in production because it lacks redundancy. It's not atomic. And we would appreciate some other things like authoriza uh, authorization by HMAC, well leveling, access control. So the Bearbox solution for that is Bearbox state which is described in the device tree, like the reboot mode we have seen before. This uh, has a backend. This backend can be any device Bearbox knows how to write to. And it defines some a set of variables that boot user can then use, which can also be used for some other stuff. We will uh, we have a Bearbox state utility that allows you to access it from within the operating system. So Bearbox fixes up this device tree snippet into the kernels. And from there on, we have this Bearbox state utility that can pass the device tree, pass to the kernel and use UDEV to find the correct Linux device. And that's all the configurations that you need. Then you can uh, just start Bearbox state and you can use it to get or set variables. The Bearbox state implementation maintains three copies for redundancy and atomicity and a CRC32 for corruption detection. And it has optional support for HMAC, where leveling by cyclically uh, writing. And it's strictly for variable storage. So you don't need a mutual, uh, mutable uh, Bearbox environment in the field. You can leave the Bearbox environment built in. Indeed, you should do that. And you should just use the Bearbox state for the uh, variables that you need to share with the user space. So that way user space can not change your boot scripts, for example, uh, by mistake. And it works great with RAUC. So there has been a talk about RAUC last year uh, here at the ELCE. I have linked another talk here as well. So this talk 
talks uh, about using Bearbox Boot Chooser with Rauk specifically. So if that's interesting to you, you might want to check that out. So how does that all look like in the end to boot a system with Bearbox Boot Chooser? It's basically just configuration in the non-volatile environment that you will put, for example, in your BSP. So it's compiled into Bearbox. Uh, it has some stuff like auto boot timeout, which is set to zero here. You can still abort Bearbox, but this uh, doesn't do a countdown. Uh, it has a boot default, which is boot chooser. It se sets up the watchdog. And then boot chooser is configured to have this number of default attempts. What when to reset attempts, for example, on a power on. Then it says which boot targets we have and how to boot each target. And everything else, the whole logic, it's already contained in Bearbox Boot Chooser. You don't need to write any scripts on your own. Boot Chooser can just take care of it. That's the normal case. Sometimes uh, you need the ability to do it another way. And for that, you can call bootm directly. So boot collects these boot entries or runs these boot scripts or passes these boot specs. And then it passes it in the end to bootm, which is for booting images. And you can just write your own boot scripts and uh, specify these variables that bootm is using or call bootm yourself. We see here an example. Bootm is used to boot a file over tftp slash mount slash tftp. And then you have that uh, file name. How that works is that slash mount slash tftp is an auto mount. So whenever it's the first, exists the first time, this command that we see here is run. If up all is done, so all interfaces are set up, then it mounts the tftp file system at that location. And this means that you can just handle this file like any other file. You can copy it, you can flash it on some device, or you can use bootm on it, which are we doing here. So that's all you need to chain load Bearbox over the network, for example. Uh, this is sometimes a bit more is needed. For example, because you don't have an image that's just executable, but it has some format that needs to be parsed. For example, a U image, a fit image, an elf. And this can also be generically handled in Bearbox by defining a new bootm handler. We see that here for this Bearbox image, the Bearbox image we talked at start, that it has an STM32 header, and we need to skip that header to reach the executable code. And that's what the Bearbox STM32 image handler is doing. So it matches against a file type. We have a file type function in Bearbox that checks the magic and returns a file type like the file command under Linux, and then it associates that file type with a bootm callback that will then get a buffer and do all the necessary things so you can boot that. This concludes the part that I wanted to talk in about uh, booting. Now comes a short uh, part about bring up. We have assumed so far that there are already drivers for the functionality you need and that they implement the bindings that you are using in the device tree. This is not always the case. Uh, sometimes you need to do port drivers to Bearbox. Most subsystem APIs were imported from Linux and are occasionally kept up to date. So often drivers are fairly easy to port. You just need to adjust them a bit to uh, you copy them and then you fix the compiling errors till it works and you test it. This is sometimes possible, for example, by the remote, with reboot mode driver, because it's mostly generic code. It was very easy to port, but sometimes you have more involved devices. Uh, and the kernel uses interrupts for those. Bearbox doesn't do interrupts. So it can be easier to port from another bootloader that differs in API, but it's already has uh, already interacts with the hardware in the way you want. If you do that, you will need to um, give special attention to some multi-image incompatibilities that you don't have when you port kernel code. For example, if devs uh, in the code, depending on an SOC uh, type, are a big no-no because they break multi-image. Same goes for attribute weak, which can be defined for some SOCs and for some other SOCs different. You will want both of them there, so it needs to be done generically. Clashing defines, or as we talked before, configuration that's globally hard-coded, for example, in a kconfig or in a make file. This should all be uh, configurable at runtime.
for example, by uh, having a P handle in the device tree to a node that you can use or by checking what's the compatible of the device tree uh, node and choosing one or the other uh, callback. And if all fails, you can try to roll your own. And if you need it in the kernel, you can port it later. When you have uh, your driver ready, you will usually get the shell access out of the box because the driver calls that you are programming against already do have character device that they allocate for I.O. memory, EPROMs, block device partitions, OTPs, net consoles, reg maps, files. So you just need to implement the same API that the driver is already implementing uh, under Linux to have it integrate with Bearbox. Uh, you also have commands for device tree manipulation. Here is a nice example. Imagine you have a board in your remote lab and the lever got broken for the, uh, for the SD card. You can just run this snippet and it will create a new init script and persist it. And that says for the uh, multimedia, uh, multimedia cards zero, uh, with, uh, that's an alias, so it looks up that alias in the device tree and says for MMC0, set a new property as a fix-up that's broken CD. What this line is doing is that every time you boot a kernel with this init script active, it will fix up a broken CD property into the identified uh, device tree node, and then the kernel won't just wait for an interrupt that will never come because your uh, card detect lever on the SD card is broken. There are also useful defaults for netboot, as we have seen before, that factor in your username and the host name of the board. And that's very nice if you share the same board between different developers. Usually all you need to do for netbooting an unconfigured board is just setting your username. And if you have the file at the correct location, you can just boot. You don't need to do any further modification to your bootloader. If you are doing a uh, bring up and you don't have yet network because network, for example, hasn't been ported yet to Bearbox the driver for it, you can also do it over serial. RedFS allows reliable communication over serial. There is an RFC for that and Bearbox implements it as a file system and it allows you to mount host directories over serial. So you can use that for net booting. There are many more commands. We don't have enough time to talk about all commands. So there is some image to the, le to the left, which I hope is some sort of raw check image, which you will look at and see the command that you most desire. If that doesn't work for you, you can run the help command that will show you which commands are in Bearbox and call help with an argument to see what the commands are doing. This help text is also mechanically extracted into Sphinx docs that you can review online. If you don't find uh, the command you are looking for, it might be not there yet. Bearbox uh, has a nice API for defining your own commands, which is basically a bosx like uh, programming uh, environment, which means you have device files, you can open them, you get file descriptors out of them, you can read and write to them, which makes user space code, for example, out of BusyBox easier to port. You also have a kernel API available, so you can control GPIOs, handle SPI transfers. You have dedicated commands for each of them. But for example, if you have a protocol that does SPI and uses GPIO for flow control and you would like to interact with it for debugging, you could just do that normally. Uh, we see an example here that's a true command, which doesn't do much. It has an alias, so it can be invoked by two different names. It has an empty completion. Uh, you can have completion for file names, for device tree nodes, for device uh, for device names, but true needs nothing of that, so it defines it as an empty completion. And it doesn't do much, it does so successfully. There are many more uh, examples in the Bearbox commands directory that you can check out. This concludes uh, my talk. This is la the last slide where I will talk a bit about recent developments in the last two years. So Bearbox has gained some uh, architecture support, for example, for the IMX8 MM, Q, and Plus. The ARM64 Layerscape is also supported. Both are SOCs from NXP. Uh, RISC-V support, initial support for that was merged upstream. The STM32 MP1, which we have looked uh, at a bit here in the talk, has also made it into Bearbox. The Calry MPPA was merged. And a bit uh, late to the party, Bearbox now has Raspberry Pi 3 support. 
We don't yet have Raspberry Pi for support. If that's something that interests you and you would like to learn more about Bearbox, that could be something you could try to get uh, acquainted with Bearbox. We also now have the ability to read, uh, to read uh, U-boot variables, the U-boot environment. This was last possible 10 years ago. Now there is a proper Bearbox driver for that that can, that allows you to mount the uh, environment as a file system and interact with it. We uh, can now load Opti and also do early loading of Opti. For example, if you need to load Opti out of the PBL to reduce your attack surface, this can now be done on some systems. Uh, the kernel address sanitizer and address sanitizers are now supported. So GCC and Clang support in compile time instrumentation of your code to catch memory safety issues. And this expects your code to cooperate with it in that it, uh, the allocator poisons memory that is freed and unpoisons memory when it allocates it. So you can detect stuff like use of the freeze. This is now possible on ARM32, ARM64. It was possible on Sandbox before that because there is already a lib uh, address sanitizer that can be readily used. Undefined behavior sanitizer is now also supported and you can compile large parts of Bearbox under Sandbox for compile testing and for running a static analysis over Bearbox. Device tree overlays are supported. Dprobe is not yet in Bearbox, but it's doing its final laps on the mailing list. So it might very well be by the time you see this talk. It's a feature I'm very excited about because it allows us to get rid of this init call shuffling and eprobe defer that we have in Bearbox. So a kernel driver, if that can't get a resource, returns uh, eprobe defer, and then it's retried at a later time. What dprobe does is that it recursively on demand will probe the devices that offer the resources that you are needing. Uh, work queues and slices also made their way into Bearbox. So, uh, so far you could have polars. These polars can, for example, flash a heartbeat LED or feed a watchdog, and they are called whenever you do a delay in Bearbox. This works nicely for this simple stuff, but for example, if you need to pull for UDP packets, you can't uh, reliably do that in Apollo because if your device uh, driver for the network uh, interface for the network chip does itself use a delay, you have a nasty recursion going on. So what happens with slices is that you can say, I would like to have the network slices, uh, network slice in the a network stack, and then if Apollo needs a network slice, it will try to claim it, and if it can't, it will just return and will be retried at a later time at which it can do stuff over the network. Work uh, queues are a um, way to schedule work items that are run in the context of the shell. And in the context of the shell, you can basically do everything. And everything is currently that Bearbox answers ICMP echo requests. So now you can quite quickly reply to pings in Bearbox and fast boot over UDP is now also supported via this work queue mechanism. So if that all got you interested, you can check the Bearbox project home at bearbox.org. We are doing the collaboration over a mailing list hosted by Infradet. So if you have patches or questions, you can ask there. A public service announcement, Infradet had an outage. So if you were subscribed or unsubscribed, this might have been reset. So you might want to check that out. We are also on IRC if you prefer that. And if you don't have a Raspberry Pi 4 handy, you can compile for Sandbox and run Bearbox under Linux and play around with it a bit. So thank you for listening. And do you have any questions?